she teaches English as a foreign language uh, methodology and is above all a specialist uh, in telecollaboration in education, which is also the name of a series by Peter Lang, uh, which she is co-editing. Uh, if, if all is okay, yes. you may start. Okay. Um, okay, I, I have to interact very closely with the screen, so, and that's really far away. <laughs> so I'm going to sit this way. Yes. Okay. My apologies, but okay. First of all, uh, I chose um, I chose to use to bring in the presentation as an ebook because, in a way, it's a narrative of something that started in 2005. Okay. Uh, secondly, I'd like to mention that, um, in a way, I feel like I should apologize because it's about teacher training. Uh, language teacher training, but for a what you could call a um, imperialist language. They were studying to become English as a foreign language. So, but we we do try to get them to also focus on other languages, and that's what will bring come up here. Okay. Um, my interests, like I said, started in in two thousand five in uh, what was. Um, of very grassroots collaboration with someone from the University of uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and from that, uh, little by little, it's developed in a research area, of re an area of research of great interest to me. Um, I feel like teachers are using ICT, but I, this has come up already dur during this, the, during this uh, symposium several times. But the paradigms of teaching have not changed. We're still teaching very much like uh, we used to in 1970s even. So many teachers are still working as if we're in a web, uh, web 1.0 world and when it's really a web 2.0 world now or 3.0 or probably nth point oh now, I don't know. But it, it means changing seriously some paradigms and I'm gonna go into that in a minute. Um, I also think that teaching a web from Web 2.0, as I've pointed here, it's learner-centered, not technology-centered. I mean, it seems like a contradiction, but it's still learner-centered because we are opening up the classroom rather than trying to control what all of the input, the moment that we allow uh, social media to become part of our teaching paradigm, we can no longer control the input, decide exactly what they're going to learn, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very much more learner-centered than teacher-centered. And it's, I would say it's not even technology-centered. If I'm not making sense, please interrupt me and tell me. It also means that we're talking about a new paradigm of cognition. And this is where I'm, I'm, I'm still fuzzy on this, I have to admit. I'm, I'm, beginning, I'm doing research in this. But what, a new cognition, it's been called socially distributed cognition. I've heard it called networked learning, which I really like, the idea of networked learning. Uh, I think there's a brilliant example of this in September last year. Video game players solved a molecular puzzle that it took over a decade, scientists have been working on it and had not solved it. In four days, video game players solved the problem. Okay? This is the new type of cognition. It's what Pat, uh, Dr. Patchler was saying yesterday. We don't have to memorize that anymore. We're not, they're not little language learners, they're not little scientists, the idea of Piaget, et cetera, et cetera, little scientists trying to construct the world through their mind. No, the world is being constructed together with someone here in Catalonia, in Japan, et cetera, et cetera, and they can solve problems that took a decade of scientists in their individual laboratories in four days they can solve. So I think that this is a, a very good example of the type of, of cognition that I'm talking about here. So, um, well, sorry. It also means change in the idea of how we teach languages obviously, and understand languages. Um, as we said in, in a quote, or, uh, in a book that we're publishing, my, myself and my colleague, um, 
In an increasingly interconnected world, students should be introduced to embedded contextualized learning and this type of learning that's social, um, not fragmented chunks of information, not about language. So my colleague and I decided that we were going to try to develop a language teaching program that c helped students connect the dots uh, with this type of social cognition. Um, sorry, I'm not controlling this too well, excuse me. There's been a lot of research into teacher education and you have the focus, uh, I'm not gonna go over this, but the idea that teachers should be reflective practitioners, the idea that dialogic teaching should be used in language teaching, the, the, the exploratory type talk is the type of group work talk that's conducive to language uh, learning, et cetera, et cetera, as you have from Mercer 2002. A lot of ideas of situated cognition. All of this, the idea of experiential modeling, all of these have been discussed uh, ad nauseum, really, uh, in teacher education. So these are the paradigms that we were beginning to work with for our uh, teacher education model. And also, as Edwards and Prothero and Akbari and several others have said, a lot of teach new teachers may have the theory that they are not able to apply it. There's still a, a, a gap, but a big gap between theory and practice. So we were trying to get them um, to get the language teacher DNA, OK? Uh, which, if you can look closely, you have applied knowledge and theoretical knowledge entwined in the language teacher DNA. So, uh, we did a lot of things with them, and it was blended learning. They were working in face to face, and they were also working online. So, this is how I understand blended learning. I'm trying to show you how much they did. They, they, they almost died in the process, uh, honestly. They had to do loads and loads of work. You can see they had to develop a, teacher's, a teaching sequence. You see it up here. Then they had to dry, uh, write a draft. If you ask what the RSTS, this is the not politically correct term that we use, the really shitty teaching sequence draft. That was our first one. So that's what an RSTS is. Uh, so to get them the idea that it doesn't matter, throw things out there. So they rewrote the draft five times. But there was, in between that, there were online meetings, face-to-face -face meetings of discussions. So this teaching sequence, you have a lot of external dialogue and a lot of internal dialogue going on as well, because they had to justify to the other why they were making these changes, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully have time to show you some examples. This went into implementation. They also had to do an action research based on uh, a self-ranking they had done pre at the beginning of the year about how their teaching skills, okay? Uh, I won't bore you with all the details here, but uh, what I'm trying to show is that we feel that through all of this dialogic learning that, they w that was taking place, not only in face-to-face, -face, but online, in things like Moodle, Skype, uh, Second Life, uh, audio chats, that, that we were helping them to understand what is socially distributed cognition so that they could then apply it in the classroom. Okay, how did we analyze this? Uh, also, I am one of the biggest difficulties of dealing with analysis of this type is the complexity. If you're saying that learning is taking through place through social interaction, then it's really hard to isolate one little item in order to show that that has had something to do with with the actual learning. So we used um, Bada et al's idea of qualitative data, then s selecting sequences, relative in, se relative in sequences, uh, section experiences into what he's called action relevant episodes, then parsing those into codes, and then uh, representing them as nodes in a network. And again, I'm not gonna go into that because it's extremely boring and, and, and takes a long time. But I wanted you to, what I will be showing are an examples, and so that you don't think this is anecdotal. They were chosen because they were recurrent themes that kept coming up. Okay, so what did, we, what did we find? That through reflection on their own learning, the student teachers became aware of the importance of dialogic interaction in teaching. 
in five out of the seven cases that we, we were looking at, this knowledge was integrated into their own pedagogical design. So you can see here, you have a text, a chat text. She says, I feel that without feedback, I wouldn't have known how to improve my unit. This is a wiki that they had to do of ongoing of their own personal reflections. So it was the wiki was also written for the rest of the people to be able to, to also comment on. So the, again, you have this dialogic interaction. Um, so without this feedback, I wouldn't have known how to improve my unit. She's the, also one who says, I had to rewrite it so many times that I, I lost track. Okay. We also have an example we can here. walk together. Okay, nice. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Suggestions. In the analysis, we found that the suggestions that she was making were very much uh, pertinent to what she had been studying in her own teaching uh, in the methods class. And then in the end, she makes a suggestion. Well, why don't you have your school collaborate with another school? And then the, other, the student in the United States says, oh, yes, that's a good idea. Like what we're doing here. So you can see the, the integration of them learning what by doing, and which is also a very uh, paradigm, very much very common. They also identified how they were learning uh, that this could be transferred to their own teaching approaches. Here you have um, in a text chat, someone had been discussing, they, they were allowed the choice of audio or uh, text chat. And in this text chat, they, they were discussing their uh, teaching sequences. And you notice that it says, oh, I'm sorry that I took up all the time. And he says, well, that's the reason we've met. He said, it's fine. It's helpful to talk about your project. I learn by talking about this stuff. So you have an example here, and then you have another example. I had been skeptical, too, about this discussion. I didn't really think it would be useful. but. Uh, but this was great. Um, I enjoyed the online review. Uh, so, Lynn, imagine if your students could receive back from the others as we've just done. So you can see that they're beginning, becoming aware of this dialogic, the use of the need for, for language. We have other examples. Uh, in, in, in the teaching sequence, they, one of the students developed an, uh, an exchange with Australia with her students because is it, I've realized the need for them to actually to communicate, to actually use the language. You have here another example of, you, with very young learners, a teacher using voice thread, which they had had to use. So they're beginning to use the very same modalities that we had introduced to them because we introduced them to many, many different modalities without telling them the purpose of introducing them to all these modalities. I don't know. Um, they became aware that language learning was a socially constructed, that their own language learning was socially constructed. Here you have an example of, in a, in a text chat, where an American explains the term swabat. And, and um, so swabat, what's swabat? So she explains, swabat is, a, is an acronym for students will be able to. And from then on out, it spread like wildfire. All my students began to use, well, what are your swabats in, in, in the face-to-face -face classes? So you can see that she says, well, you know, it's good to have USA peers. And then she mentions in her own evaluation how much this had helped her to learn specific terminology to teach her education. So they were reflecting on their la own language learning as a socially constructed uh, process. They also, you could see, that it facilitated intercultural communication and reflection. Here you have some discussion about Catalan. Um, oh yes, are you an independent, independista? Yeah, she says, okay, now I have to work on my Catalan, not just Spanish. So you see students taking interest in each other's language and in each other's cultures. This was also evident. What they had to do, uh, this apostle, I don't know if you're familiar with apostle, European portfolio of students of teachers, uh, student teachers of languages. They had to do a self-ranking at the beginning of the year, a self-ranking of the many, many competences that are, that are stated in this guidelines. They did a self-ranking, what they had felt that they already had assimilated, what they wanted to work on. And then they came back to it and at the end of the year and had to self-rank again and discuss in their 
portfolios what they felt like they had assimilated of what they had indicated they wanted to assimilate. So you can notice that they all mentioned, most of them mentioned that they felt like they had learned the ideas of using new technologies and ICT for language learning and, and within the ideas of a socially constructed language learning process. Here you have an example of them, what they did, their, their self-assessment. Then I also wanted to mention that from all of these teachers, I've received many emails from them. And, and this is a bit personal here, but they've, in the, uh, I would say at least 80% of them have written to me since they've graduated and have said, you know, what I've learned, I've, I'm now applying. So there's, there's a reflection, even after they've finished their, the program, they're telling me, yes, I understand now things that I learned before, they're still making connections. So um, we, I am seeing evidence of this being a continuing process. So our aims were to make the teachers aware of the need of a paradig paradigmatic shift a shift that includes a new vision of how to approach language teaching content, planning and evaluation, so that includes plurilingual, multimodal view of knowledge and socially distributed knowledge construction. Okay, that was a big aim, but then that was our aim. It's not just about shifting a few moments of time, a few activities to ac accommodate computer, some, uh, some computer activities. It's about shifting entire paradigms. It's about opening up the classroom, uh, I th this was mentioned, I think, yesterday by um, Dr. Rebin, the idea of opening up the classroom through social media um, for a real purpose, not artificially built language situations inside the classroom. So this means that understanding, this means understanding that the language learning environment cannot be controlled by the teacher anymore. If once you've opened up that classroom through social media, the input that they're going to be receiving is no longer what you're telling them to say. It's no longer little dialogues that they can practice, which is quite a scary I, a feeling. And my students did express this, the, 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 the worries they had about this. Um, it means being able to accept the idea of cognition in the wild. Uh, uh, that's quite a familiar term nowadays. Um, and I would say that as our aims, as far as our aims goes, we do feel like we achieved not all of them, but we're on our way. It's a long road. Uh, it's applicable across the board to just about any language, I believe. Um, and because we had them, they resisted this incredibly, but we had them in the second uh, semester creating activities together to create an, uh, a podcast together on online groups, and they were doing all of their activities in Second Life to create this. They resisted this very much. They didn't, my students didn't like it because they didn't find a purpose for it in primary education, but, but they, they, they held out. And as one of the students said, um, I even learned how to kite surf, which means wind surf to kite surf in Second Life. So uh, there's an even other competences <coughs> acquired that they hadn't expected to acquire. So thank you very much. I don't know how I did on time. Yes, yes, yeah? perfect okay. on time. Thank you very much. Uh, with your presentation, as you noticed, we shifted, we moved from a minority language uh, to the imperialistic language uh, par excellence. Uh, but the main point is that uh, the, the impact of the new media on uh, language, uh, in this case language teaching and language learning, is uh, very strong. And uh, I think you offered us uh, uh, several uh, stimulus and uh, indications uh, uh, of how the manner of uh, teaching uh, already changed uh, and is going to change uh, in the next future. I open the discussion. Lucia Chok. I have some very concrete questions. How do you succeed in motivating teachers to do extra work? They have a lot of extra work. And how do you organize the schedule that combine the schedule of the students 
and of the teacher, and how many students per teacher you can manage in this kind of work? Thank you. Excellent question. <laughs> and I have to say, I, I admit right now that we went, uh, it was a roller coaster ride. Uh, by half the year, my students were in mutiny. They had compared with the work they were doing with the other students and they were so angry with me that I didn't think I was going to walk out of the classroom alive. So I had to negotiate with them. Uh, uh, what I did at that point was to tell them, all right, you're all right now have an excellent. The only way you won't get an excellent is by not working. So, I mean, and th this was, it was a, d a rather drastic measure. Uh, <laughs> we were in time of drastic measures. It's a, it was a crisis. So. Uh, the fact that they trusted me, I think, was very important. I mean, I know that sounds strange, but they trusted me that they were learning because in the, it took me an entire hour and a half to negotiate at this midterm when we reached this crisis where they realized how much more work they were doing than the other people. Uh, it took me an hour and a half to negotiate what we were going to do, but the quest, the end was they, 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 I left the room and allowed them to discuss, and the end was they told me, we see that we are actually learning a lot more than other people, so we do want to keep it up. Uh, I think the, 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 the fact the, all of this reflection that was going on orally and written, because they were having to keep a, a wiki about everything and, and changing. Every time they did a, uh, the, went from the really shitty rough draft, <laughs> really rough draft to, to newer drafts, they had to explain why they had made these decisions, what had stimulated these decisions. So all of this reflection, and in the end, another reflection they had to do was to go back at the very end of the year, even though they had finished the rough draft, they had finished their course, they had finished the implementation, go back and rewrite that teaching sequence again as a professional teacher. They s said, you take the role now as a professional teacher, what would you change looking back and why? So this was their final. Uh, uh, note. Uh, I also did not give a final exam. That made a big difference, I think. It was, it was uh, every, all the work went into the final. Uh, how many students did I have? Well, I was working with 60 in methods course, and then with, uh, uh, I had 14 in, a pra in a teaching placement. So it was a lot of work for, uh, for us as well, but I think it was worthwhile. Yeah. Well, uh, one other thing I would mention is one way that the only way I saved myself was we had a lot of peer review. Yeah, so I was not having to be the only one who was doing uh, evaluations. I don't know if I answered your question. But. Uh, <coughs> I like it very much. Appreciate it when you said uh, I want to open uh, the uh, classroom to the reality of speaking and acting. So you formulate a different way. Uh, by means of the um, media, modern media. Um, my question is, when you said cognition in the wild, I think wonderful formulation, thank you. Um, uh, I want to know, do you have in mind specific constellations, social constellations, to which you want to make access to outside the classroom? So um, I think w one could imagine uh, specific institutional uh, constellations like doctor-patient communication or uh, other forms of communication which are socially real. So that's my question. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, we, what we were looking for with these particular students was to create a virtual community of practice. I know that community of practice is also quite a, a mundane uh, term nowadays, but we were trying to get them to become, we felt like you have to walk the walk and talk the talk to be a teacher. So, I mean, you, you have an example of the, the, them adopting this terminology of swabats. Uh, the swabat actually came from my colleague in the University of Illinois, so you could see how it spread from one American colleague to his students than from his students to my students. But it was not only the linguistic effect of that, it also made them think so much more about their, the, the need for thinking of objectives when, when they were planning. The, that, the, the audio is their discussion of obje the need to, to, to exemplify the objectives in the teaching sequence on the American students' uh, part, my student, 
critiquing this. So one of the constellations for the, the student teachers is a community of practice made up of other student teachers and teachers, uh, whole teachers. I also invited the placement te school placement teachers to take part in all of this dialogue. Only three did, unfortunately. Uh, how would they transfer this into their classroom? My students were preparing to be primary ed teachers, so I think that obviously the, there's going to have to be more control on the type of constellation that goes on. But I do believe that there needs to be more types of telecollaboration between primary ed, for example. Um, it's hard for me, sorry, it's hard for me to imagine what kind of constellations these teachers are going to develop once they're in their own classroom. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I think that any language learner or teacher would have to look to provide opportunities for that particular language, whether it's Frisian or Catalan or English. So I, d I don't know if I answered your question. There is another question, other two? Questions and then. Then coffee. <laughs> coffee is waiting for us. Yes. There are two. I concepts. say that to get the questions short. <laughs> there are two concepts that have come up: learning by doing. On the one hand. I'm 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 sorry. I, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. There are two concepts that have cropped up: learning by doing and communities of practice, and both of them are related. Now the essence of communities of practice and learning by doing is to develop a situation where your practices are an inherent process of the social so that they are tacit, so you're doing it almost by repetition and constantly and so on. And in that sense it's non-reflexive. How do you relate within those processes, how do you relate the reflexive and the non-reflexive? Because if you carry on along those lines, you will have a totally non-reflexive teacher, which doesn't make sense, you know? Yes, I, I agree with you 100%, and this is why we said virtual communities of practice, because um, what our students are seeing are very isolated communities of practice of only re repetitious and reproduction of the same social systems that they're seeing in the schools where they're going to. So Catalan teachers are seeing only Catalan. By opening it up to other uh, teachers across the world, they're, they're seeing other communities of practice um, ideas of teaching. But then at the same time, we are trying to break out of this idea of com this limited parameters of, of communities of practice, as you very well pointed out, by saying, yes, but let's also look at the idea of think about how you are constructing your knowledge. You're taking bits and pieces here and there. So this is the socially distributed cognition. So I do think that, uh, that um, uh, communities of practice are limiting in a way, but it, it depends on the actual practice that you uh, promote, whether you can break those parameters. Again, I don't know if I answered your question. So a last question. <coughs> Not so much a question, but a comment and an invitation. Okay. You made mention of English as the target language of her project, but I read some Catalan, so it must be a multilingual classroom. And that's my invitation about. I'm running a project with the Council of Europe, teacher training for the multilingual classroom, in which we have exactly those things are going to include for the next three years, in order to create new opportunities, new ways of doing. And since we do combine that, and that's my answer also to Lucia, Chuck, to with a project on my school's network for secondary school, students in which we combine the students doing the interference work with students at secondary school for them it creates the internship online and it helps the children improving their languages and that is so far with English as a target language but we're going to do that to broaden to more languages because as soon as the technique is developed you can apply it at all languages so, be welcome as a member of the teacher training for the multilingual classroom project.
Thank you very much. Uh, may, may I just, one thing I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, so that you don't think I'm such an imperialist. Um, the University of uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign is actually, it was an, a master's degree program. My students were undergrads, so they were really intimidated at first. But this class, uh, there were only two in English speakers uh, as a native speaker. The rest of them, the other 20, I th believe there were 23, the others were from other parts of the world. So um, maybe I can be excused a little bit from that one. Thank you. But I use the term.